Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Craft of the Draft podcast. Really big week of footy. The girls' champs is finished and Metro surprised us all and they got up to win their first national championship since 2019. But a lot to talk about and we're going to go straight from the top with the under-17s future trials that happened this weekend at Werribee and Jonty. You were down at that one. A, a lot to see from this type of game because it, it is where a few of the boys can put their names on the map and, and this is obviously the trials to play on AFL Grand Final Day that that first game of the day so pretty special occasion but let's get stuck into it Vic Country played New South Wales and ACT and and New South Wales got the job done both the interstates beat the Vicks but we'll start firstly with the Vic Country boys I'll let you start off the top but Job Scapen is the one I'll I'll let you you start off about tell me a bit about his game and we'll slowly work down that list of the best performers yeah Job Scapen was really good throughout the day he's a Gippsland power player who was really highly regarded last year playing at the under 16s national championships and has played some pretty strong footy for the power this year as well he's kicking efficiency and smooth moving throughout the day really caught the eye and I thought his ability to play some different positions as well uh, showed his flexibility and he'll be someone who'll be really hard to stop for Gippsland next year. So in a really even day, I thought for Vic Country where no one really absolutely stood out and took the game by the scruff of the neck, he was one who was able to have some eye-catching moments. Tell me about Toby Cinema, Riley Hilliard too that I know impressed you, but what about their games stood out for you? Yeah, I think from Toby Cinema, he's another one who was Vic Country under 16s last year and, and has played some really good footy for Dandenong on the wing and off half back. He looks really at home on the wing now. He also plays local footy on the wing and he provides a lot of overlap run. He's got a really good tank and he's really pacey as well. And that really came through on the day, multiple possessions in a chain on several occasions. And Riley Hilliard Hilliard was a bit of a surprise packet. Another one from the Dandenong Stingrays, along with Tyron Amu, who also impressed with his physicality in the first half. But Riley Hilliard, it was probably his aggression and his willingness to win the contested ball, even when he was playing out on the wing, that was quite surprising, I guess. We we haven't necessarily seen him play that breakout game for Dandenong yet, but probably the weekend was what you would consider to be a, a good launch pad into 2025 for him. Archie Taylor, Josh Lindsay, two others, and and then I'll let you finish with Taron Amu. But tell me about those first two and and I guess the aspects that stood out. Uh, from Josh Lindsay and and uh, I, was, I mean Josh Lindsay was so impressive throughout the day. I think his his intercepting was absolutely outstanding and. And the the way he started really set the scene for his day. He took some big marks, but just reads the play really well, reads the cues of the kickers coming inside 50. So he was really good. And Archie Taylor, similar things can be said. He's been really consistent and got... A lot of really strong form behind him at GWV. We know they've been really injury riddled, but what he's been able to do has has been really impressive through the middle part of the year. He's been a real mainstay for them down there. And he was another one who, yeah, really set the game up with his distribution from a Vic Country perspective. But yeah, that, that were probably the main ones um, from Vic Country. Obviously, it was a loss. So yeah, a few of those players we talk about were, were in defence or, or were getting back to help the defence uh, because the game was played quite predominantly probably in New South Wales AT's forward half. Well, I know you would have watched um, New South Wales with a lot of interest given they've got a few Murray boys that are just on the New South Wales yeah. side of the border. So I'll let you touch on them first. Ryder Corrigan's the main one that we've we've heard a lot about this year and, and he's produced some really good moments for Murray. Liam Heatherton and Harry Wilson, I guess, just tell me about those three boys. What's the future of Murray look like next year? Yeah, pretty strong, I think. I mean, they've got a they've got a pretty solid team this year. We know they got six drafted last year and they'll go close to matching that number this year with some of the forwards and key position players they've got up there. But I think what was really impressive from Ryder Corrigan, I had him as best on ground in that first game. And his 187 centimetres is what he's listed at. But I reckon he's grown since the start of the season and he certainly uses his size to power out the front of stoppage and he's a real clearance player. He's really strong and he's really clean as well. So he's someone who's going to be a real handful alongside Riley Onley for Murray next season. And then they'll be kicking it into Liam Heatherton, who has captured a little bit of attention with some pretty good form for Murray in the last month or so, which is pretty impressive when he's playing alongside the Whitlock twins up forward. But um, yeah, he was the main man up there and took some contested marks, kicked three goals in the third quarter and finished with a bag of five, but his aerial presence was really impressive. And at the other end, Harry Wilson was chopping off lots of balls coming in. He's intercepting a real feature throughout the day. And then I'll let you touch on a few of the other non-Murray boys, Lockie Carmichael, Noah Chamberlain. He played 
some from some national championships footy this year and Max Kin, which that'll be a bit confusing if he gets to the big yeah. time in a couple of years. But tell me about those other non-Murray boys for the for New South Wales ACT. Yeah, I mean, there probably was a little bit of confusion at some stages in the game from a Max King perspective because he was taking contested marks inside 50. Now, he's not that same sort of big key position player. He's not going to develop into that. He doesn't have the size of Max King from St Kilda, but he's one who, yeah, has his own traits and his ability to start forward, take some contested marks and generate some scoring shots for his team was really impressive. Then he went through the midfield, was so clean and dynamic through there as well. So that's going to be his go in the next 12 months or so. And then, yeah, Lockie Carmichael and Noah Chamberlain, we've started to know what we're going to get from them. Lockie Carmichael, lots of possessions, probably the leading ball winner for New South Wales ACT, I would have said, or or he certainly would have been up there and his penetration was really impressive. And Noah Chamberlain's a Swans Academy prospect whose overhead ability was what was most impressive. Move now to Vic Metro and Queensland. And Queensland brought a pretty stacked team, which we'll touch on. But Queensland, yeah, they got the job pretty, they got the job done quite comfortably from from all reports. And Metro, yeah, we'll we'll touch on them. And Ollie Graves was the one that you're top of the list. He's been playing some consistent footy at the Rangers now, but this is a big statement yeah. for him, I guess. I, is that, is that enough to see him on grand final day, do you reckon? Yeah, I do think so. And we, and it should be noted that, like you said, Queensland brought a strong squad. Some of the players that were missing from a Victorian perspective, Noah Hibbins-Hargreaves, Willem Dersma, Jackson Dalton, Harley Hicks, Ben Rongda, Louis Emmett, Mitch Moat, Xavier Bamert and Riley Onley, all yeah. who ha- are highly regarded and many of which who played in the national championships. So the Victorian teams were a little bit weakened to give some others opportunity. Ollie Greaves probably came into the day with the highest reputation of any of the Vic Metro players and he showed why with his power, his cleanliness and his just class through the midfield. He he felt like every every possession he had, there was a sizzling kick that would hit a target and he was able to win plenty of clearances and use his physicality really well. And yeah, his form perhaps has wavered here and there throughout the season. He's obviously a Caulfield grammar boy as well, so we haven't seen him fully in action for the Eastern Rangers, but it's probably as well as I've seen him play this season, having not obviously followed him all too closely for Caulfield grammar. But yeah, no, a really impressive showing from Ollie Greaves through the midfield. Tell me about his Eastern counterpart, Andrew Barker. I guess his performance alongside Greaves. Yeah, I mean, he was quieter in the fourth quarter. He copped a knock to the knee towards the end of the third quarter, which sort of grounded him late in the game. But his first and third quarters in particular were really impressive. And he's someone that I think since the start of the year, I've been really big on. He's going to develop into that nicely sized intercepting defender. And he, he's taking intercept marks at ease now. And he's really composed back there with his ability to provide a provide a provide a possession uh, that's that's really calm under pressure and, and find a target really safely. But, um, yeah, it's his aerial presence that's most impressive. So I really liked him and, um, yeah, he worked well with, with plenty of other defenders as well. Sam Grillage started in defence. I thought he was really good off halfback. It's his cleanliness and his ability to hit the ball at pace that really stood out. He's one of the hardest workers at Oakley from all reports and um, I think it showed why on the day with his fundamentals and speed. I'll keep you on the Oakley, uh, in the Oakley area and touch on Jack Guys and Aaron Sharkey, fellow teammates as well. Yeah, both played on the wing uh, at times, and I thought Jack Ison's work rate was really, really impressive because what he was able to do was probably produce what you'd say is pretty close to the perfect winger's game. There were plenty of times where he got back in defensive 50, provided an out number, provided an outlet kick, but he was also able to get forward and actually kicked a goal at one stage as well and got involved in plenty of play on transition. So it was a really strong showing from Jack Ison, probably a player that we don't know as much about compared compared to some of the other players on the day, but he certainly made a statement. And then, yeah, his his Oakley teammate in Aaron Sharkey was another one who was really strong. He His kicking was really assured, and, and I thought he was another one who, when the play really opened up, he was able to be that player that linked up well and kicked it inside 50 and, and hit a target or put it to really good spots. The two Toms from Western... I feel like there's enough said with them already that you, we, we repeat what we say very often, but that's because they're both very classy. Tom McGowan and Tom Burden, I guess, wrap up their days for me. Yeah, pretty pretty similar to what we know we're going to get. His decision-making in close, Tom McGowan was really impressive, was able to release teammates and kicked a goal from a 50-metre penalty. And, and Tom Burton, we haven't seen as much of. We'll probably see him off half back to finish the season for Western. But yeah, his skill execution in the clinches is really good as well. Three colder boys to touch on for Metro to finish it up. And Hussein Alachka, he's so dangerous up in that forward 50. Felix Knaip and Cooper Duff Titler. Tell yep. me all about them because I feel like they're all pretty unique individuals in their own sense, the way they go about it. But 
yeah, run me through each of them. Yeah, you're right. They do all have their own unique stories. I guess Felix Knipe's story is that he's been racking it up at Wesley College, playing school footy, averaging 30-plus disposals, and had some massive games in there as well. So we haven't seen him a lot for Calder, but the, the future looks really bright for him, and he showed he was able to translate that school form to the higher level on Saturday with his speed and his athleticism in the contest. I thought that was what was really impressive, and he he's um, he, he yeah got midfield minutes, so he's clearly really highly regarded and has put a really strong case forward to play that grand final day. Hasina Al-Ashkar is one who, yeah, has basically played every game for Calder this season, like you say, generates plenty of scoring shots and did so again on Saturday. Scored the two goals in the first half. It felt like he had a lot more impact than that, though, because he set plenty up with his X-Factor and speed out of the contest as well. And then, yeah, Cooper Duff title of the storyline, obviously, but having the national level basketball background, probably a little bit of a quieter day for him, but he was playing mostly inside 50 and the ball didn't go up there all that often for Vic Metro, who were comprehensively defeated. He did take a few contested marks, though, and I thought his follow-up at ground level was absolutely sensational for a player of his size as well and shows that dexterity he's got from his basketball background. A few Queensland boys to, to run through, and I'll start on three recognisable names in the Queensland scene, Zeke Ewell and Bo Ardensaw and Dan Annabel, I guess, touch on their games. That Was it pretty stock standard? And especially Dan Annabel and Zeke Ewell, and they've, they've obviously shown they're capable of it. Yeah, in the, in the champs already. Yeah, I mean Dan Annable was definitely the best of the lot. I thought he's really clean. He dis- he distributes well and feeds to teammates who provide the overlap run. His decision making in close and ability to hit hit teammates uh, with his handballing was really impressive. Zeke Yulin played down back for most of the day, took the kickouts and sliced teams open with his kicking efficiency. And Bo Adensal is probably a little bit behind that pair in terms of his standing at the moment, but absolutely played a sensational game on the weekend. And in reflection, perhaps was a little bit unlucky not to make my top five because his work rate and his willingness to win the inside footy and his hunt and his hunger was really strong. So so that was probably the, the wrap of those three. And then Dylan Patterson, Cooper Collins, Raphael Gisu, three names not so familiar with, but tell me a bit about their games and, and, and why they were in your best. Yeah, I think Dylan Patterson at halftime was the best player on the ground pretty comfortably, maybe slowed down a little bit after that, but he has got tricks. He has got attributes that are going to have AFL clubs interested and interested very high in the draft next season. He's quick, he's evasive, he's clean, and he's very, very hard to tackle when he's going at full speed. So I think he's that modern player that is going to make a real statement next year through through the, the talent league when he plays and through the national champs as well. Raphael Gisu is that sort of creative forward type of player who has a lot of X factor and is able to impact with not too many possessions. And Cooper Collins was a real surprise packet. His third quarter was absolutely enormous and has a lot of class and presence inside 50, finishing with a couple of goals. Move now to the Vic Metro SA Vic Country WA doubleheader on the weekend, which, yeah, like I said, Metro turned it on it was unbelievable their tackle pressure and just the pressure they provided across four quarters I in all honesty thought it would drop off at some point because it was that ridiculous that you just think naturally as fatigue you know picks up they're gonna drop off but they got by half time five five straight to one four so the scoreboard was telling a bit of the story at one point SA were having one inside 50 for every four touches, but they just couldn't do anything yep. with it. And Vic Metro's defense was was stellar. I mean, yeah, 30 to 10 at half time. They got out to 44 to 17 at three-quarter time and wrapped it up with a 21-point win. So it was huge for Metro. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll start you off with Sierra Greaves, probably the story of the day and a Western Jets player who is the clear standout from that region and, um, yeah, has stood up in the absence of some others at times this year, but to do it on the big stage was was really telling. Yeah, she was awesome. I mean, it was from the first bounce as well. She started in that centre stoppage and it felt like she was just a, a really relied upon figure throughout the whole day and she roved really well. Her inside 50 entries were elite. She was accumulating a lot with little handballs here and there, but it was her productivity that still made her really effective around the ground. Kicked a really elite goal from 40 meters out on the run. She was clean above her head with her hands. Her power, her natural power was there. I feel like it just, it was a summary of what you're going to get from Greaves at the next level just in the one game. She was terrific. And a strong day for the Western Jets in general with Lulu Field playing a little bit of a breakout game and showing what she can do off halfback with her aerial ability. Yeah, she was awesome. She was one that really 
you know, took me by surprise in terms of how dominant she was. I think she had 11 touches in the first quarter and five marks, I think, by quarter time. Her hands were terrific. A few were intercept marks that were really strong. She put her body in the way Mm. and was really demanding. She was clean out of traffic, just had some really good defensive moments where she'd stop and over the back or or a possible uh, goal scoring opportunity. Her body work was really, really good and just natural pressure around the ground, had a really good goal-saving smother. I think yep. it was in uh, probably the, the, the fourth quarter, or third quarter, something like that. But, yeah, just really, really switched on and was super, super. That's it. Yeah. She was just yeah. super. She was really good, yeah. Yeah. No, nah, it's, um, it's really good to hear um, her stringing together some strong form and Sienna Tallaridi, no doubt, would have been a, a really irrepressible presence alongside her in defense. Yeah, it was pretty stock standard eh? and that's 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 the thing with her like it was one of her best games but it felt like it nothing special because that's how that's what we're used to at this point two intercept marks she took within the first 10 minutes so she was switched on her defensive moments were really good in terms of being able to shut down ground balls that were kind of rolling inside 50 she was really clean with it and she distributed it really well she was so understanding where the transition was moving before she even picked it up was what held her, I think, a level above a lot on the field on that day. And I think she understood the way SA wanted to move it as well. They're very, very good at their transition moving. Their kicking was terrible on the day, which obviously helped Metro's case, but she just understood it. She was in the right spots at the right time. The forward line for Vic Metro has a lot of firepower. We've seen it throughout the championships. Georgie Brisbane, Emma McDonald and Grace Ballany. Grace Ballany leading the charge on Sunday. Yeah, it was an interesting mix. I mean, Emma McDonald got up early. She was the one that was there and producing moments, a great check side for the first goal. Her marking presence was great. Bellany was the one who I thought was consistently lively and was able to push up and feel like a midfielder at times. So it, it wasn't just one of those forwards who pushes up for a marking mm-hmm. contest. She was good at ground level and around all the, the stoppage, stoppages just outside 50, it felt like she was able to get first hands on it quite a lot. Georgie Brisbane was shut down. That was the reality of her day. It was just a really good defensive performance and she wasn't able to get herself in it as much as she liked. And Georgia Knight, she kicked three goals from seven touches and it was just she was just so opportunistic, really made the most of her moments and ended up with nine goals in three games. So uh, she could have won the... Uh, if there's a golden boot in the champ, yeah. she probably would yep. have won. I don't actually know for sure, but that was that was about the forward mix. It was everyone had their moments. Georgie Br- Brisbane was the only one who who really got shut down, but it was good that the others lifted and were able yep. to be there in her presence. Such a rich footballing region, the Eastern Rangers, particularly from a female perspective. And Josie Bamford was another one on the day who was really strong. I've really liked what I've seen from her in the ruck this season. And um, yeah, she produced it for Vic Metro, so I showed she could do it at the next level. Yeah, well, I guess the question with rucks is, you know, how mobile can they be around the stoppages? Are they just simply there to provide a tap presence? But she wasn't. She was really live, lively. Her pressure around the contest was what I think helped her elevate to that next level. Her offensive movement as well was really good. Her running patterns really complemented the way the mids were moving it, so she wasn't falling behind a lot. And her tap work was really good at times. It was just natural tap work that, you know, that's always something to pick up with rucks that we can forget. But she was hitting it right down their throats at times, which I thought was just, yeah, it complemented her day really well. Anyone else from a Vic Metro perspective that you wanted to touch on? Scout Howden's the last one that I think was unlucky not to feature in my top five in the end. Her pressure around the ground was really good, played on the outside. Her composure was terrific. One that moving inside 50 again, understood the, the running patterns really well. And that's something she's done really good at Sandy all year, even out of D50 when she pushed back defensively. She was terrific. And then we move on to the Vic Country game. It was great to see them get their first win of the championships as well uh, right at the end. And it was certainly led by their formidable midfield trio that have been so good throughout these championships and Sarah Howley, Lucia Painter and Ash Centra. If you want to start with them, they would have kick-started the day for Country against WA. Yeah, well, if you saw the score, it was 63-31, but it, it was also 56-0 to at one point. So it was unbelievable. It was a, literally a game of two halves. And yeah. That sounds stupid, but you know what I mean. It was ridiculous. WA played a game in the second half that would have won it for them. That's how good they were in the end. But yeah, it was those three that they were ridiculous. I mean, Howley, it was like... She just finds her way around it so easily and it was so crafty. She accumulated it really well but used it so well. Her corridor penetration I thought was terrific. She was... You know, she was ready to be aggressive when she needed to be. Her inside 50 kicking was really unselfish and was really clean as well. Out of the middle... 
below her knees. She's just so – she's able to just find her way onto the footy and move it out so quickly. And I, I, I thought it was a athleticism as well. She yep. felt very agile to the point where it was – it was almost a, a next level thing for her. Ash Centra was, yeah, nuts. I mean, she played at half forward. The She was playing on someone smaller than her, which was a bit interesting. And she, you know, after five minutes said, you know what, I'm better than you and, and did Ash Centra things really. Yeah, she was so yeah. crafty. Took a few really good contested marks. Like her marking something I think has got really good and a lot better during this year. She That's just, amazing yeah. when you think of the the base level of where her marking yeah. was at the end of last year. If it's gotten better, where are we? She was really, yeah, she was terrific. Uh, she, I mean, she dropped a few, but she just gets her hands on it a lot better now and really is able to make her body presence felt. And yeah, the burst out of stoppage and Lou Payne, it, yeah, she was awesome as well. Her offensive movement was, was definitely the best for country in the end. Presented well in the corridor as well to provide an option constantly. Yep. Her work rate was there. That constant toughness and strength around the contest as well stood out. Yeah, that strength has certainly been her go throughout these national championships. Ali Simons, I think there's a lot of intrigue around how she was going to go with the last game of the championships. Obviously, missed the first two uh, through injury as well as the early part of the talent league season, but has been in sterling form for the Stingrays and played in the forward line for Vic Country. Yeah, it was really intrigued to watch her because this was obviously her only game of the championships, only got to play this one, and, and I thought she was terrific. Her tackle pressure was there. She was crafting the ruck contest, and they did. And she did lose a lot of them, but it was it was just a taller opponent that was. Yeah. But they weren't as mobile. She wasn't as mobile. Her direct opponent, but that's where Simon's had the advantage there. She she was really good when the ball went to ground. She was able to be an asset in transition as well, move the ball inside fifty a lot as well. So it was that offensive presence she was able to provide. It didn't have a lot of time in the forward line, which I would have liked to see. But the game was kind of over by half time, and it yeah. there wasn't really any need to do that so yeah i thought she 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 didn't prove anything new put it that way but that's a good thing in terms that she just matches it at that level yeah. really well yeah certainly and um yeah i don't think there'll be too many concerns about what what she's doing in the ruck i don't think that'll be her position at the next level uh but um no nah, really good to hear her going well and then to finish off her her stingrays teammate Gemma reynolds and uh lexi gregor from the bendigo pioneers as well yeah, Gemma Reynolds was really good. I thought she was so clean, especially that first half. To be honest, I don't think anyone had a good second half, just the nature of this game. They were belted Vic Country after half time. But in that first half, she was awesome. Her inside 50 vision, she's so nifty and understands how to seize the moment really well. Her aggressiveness through the corridor, her toughness around the contest as well was, was awesome. And Lexi Gregor, and I didn't realize this on the day, but going back to stats, she had 14 intercepts in the end, which, yeah, I mean... I did notice that, but it didn't feel like that many. So that that speaks to the volume that she's able to get herself involved in in little moments as well. Mm. But she was aggressive when she moved her kicks into the corridor. Yeah, her marking was terrific all day. And Jamaica Douglas equals her in terms of intercept marking. She was awesome. I don't think the stats reflect how how crucial she was to that team. The amount of time she put her body on the line and showed her strength. She was she was awesome as well. Absolutely. Well, we've got a team of the the championships. We'll go through it line by line. And, yeah, obviously based on the three games that each of the teams played throughout the national championships, uh, it's a a Victorian team of the championships or a talent league team of the championships, we should say. And I'll start with the full back line, Ali Hall, whose numbers don't necessarily reflect how big an impact she had for the Allies. She's a Murray Bush Rangers product, but her intercepting really strong. Holly Egan has been recast as a defender through... Uh, the middle stages of this season and she's been a real general down there and you talked about Lexi Gregor there who finished the championships with a real bang and gets herself in smart positions as you said. Yeah, well she did, I should have mentioned she played uh, her, a mix of time in the back and forward line so she yep. falls into this back line purely out of I do think her best footy was played there with her intercepting. At times on the half back line, Jamaica Douglas, Lulu Field and Sienna Tallarity, all three produced really strong marking efforts in the end. I think that's what put them in there. Yep, certainly. On the centre line, we've got Gemma Reynolds on one of the wings who's really clean and racks up a lot of the footy. Sierra Greaves, who's made a real statement throughout this season, as we've said, and Zoe Hargreaves, who's played a couple of really strong games as well. I really liked her start to the national championships in particular. Yeah, 100%. On the half forward line, Ash Centra. I mean, she did play most of her time in the forward line during these champs. She wasn't needed in that in that centre. That's how powerful our uh, country's midfield was. Grace Balony and Georgie Brisbane ran out the half forward line. 
And then the full forward line, Georgia Knight, who has made a real statement, like you said, yeah. with her goal kicking and creativity at ground level. Emma McDonald, whose marking is as good as anyone inside 50 in this draft crop. And Stella Huxtable, the bottom major, who's strong and good overhead as well. Yeah, she was awesome. Well-deserved spotting there. And then the Rovers, Josephine Bamford in the ruck, which is, yeah, very impressive to see her end up in there. Sarah Howley and Lou Painter, both terrific. Didn't really have a bad game, either of them. And then on the interchange bench, we've got Sarah Pousty's toughness, Sophie Mackay's class, Priya Bowering, a bottom major who started to make some real waves, and Maggie Marnie as well. Fortunately, she's out with injury for an extended period now. Collarbone injury yeah, sustained yeah. against the young guns, but um, certainly has played some strong footy throughout the season, particularly through the championships. So, yeah, that's our, that's our team of the champs. I did put together the leaderboard if we did a champs medal. Now, the reason we didn't do a champs medal for the girls is we weren't able to watch every single game in the girls' champs as there were uh, an extra as an extra team in the girls' champs. It just didn't work out that way. But Howley for the Vicks won. Vic Country would have won it by four. That's how impressive she was. Had a gap on Sierra Greaves, who was in our second spot in the end. But we'll now move into our final segment we've done this last couple of weeks and we've talked about the state academy sorry it's not state academy state league performers from the talent league and Mm. i mean the main one to talk about was levi ashcroft who goes up to brisbane and demands an afl spot with one game 35 touches two goals eight marks is that one of the best first state league games i don't remember what will did he was pretty good when he played yeah 28 i think 28 yeah did did that be one of the best that was that's unbelievable that stat line and yeah Yeah. two goals as well and i think i mean i I mean we obviously talked about it when we talked about jagger's first game a couple of weeks ago but it's one thing for george stevens big body to go in and get 26 disposals on debut but levi ashcroft is 179 centimeters and yeah yeah, i mean he's not small um in terms of you know he has got a bit of strength but uh yeah to do that just speaks to his smarts and and hunt and work rate and that sort of thing so yeah a really strong game but i think finno sullivan was another big talking point yeah because he's in the mix for that number one spot and yeah showed his um showed his movement through traffic and kicked a couple of goals for Richmond, playing on limited minutes as the 23rd man alongside Jagger Smith, who continued to impress. But, uh, yeah, it was good yeah. to see him capture some really strong form after an injury-interrupted journey this season. He had 12 touches, two goals, six kicks. Yeah. On a, in a 30-second conversation, is he genuinely a pick one? Do you take him as pick one? I think it's I think it's risky, and uh, and that's not not due to his AFL attributes or his upside or anything like that. He just hasn't got the body of work behind him that I would confidently say, yeah, you can absolutely take him with number one. Just and that is partially through injury, partially through the fact that he's been a little bit limited because we've he's had to play school footy the last couple of years. I yeah. think there's safer picks um, for for number one. I think he'll become a very good player, but I, I'd still lean towards Smiley, even though his form has been a little bit haphazard in the last couple of months really we'll obviously talk about that you know in in the next couple of weeks toby trevaglia all Carlton italian fans would have said who's this who's this italian boy in our team can he yeah. play for us in the future but he had 15 touches five tackles pretty productive from toby good to see him get his first opportunity at, at state league level yeah, yeah, no, nah, it certainly was. And, um, yeah, he's he's going to become a, a really good player with his mix of offense and defense. And then, um, yeah, Job Shanahan at Essendon um, finished with two goals, three. So his ability to generate scoring shots was really impressive for them. And, yeah, he's going to be a real prospect going forward. And then Alwood Peckett, the St Kilda father-son prospect, also got a taste of state league footy for the Sandy Zebras. Had 14. Had 14 disposals. And, yeah, that comes off the back of a fortnight of really strong form for the dandy nong sting race all right tips to finish it off we're going to start with the boys two more weeks left so from now on it's talent league footy reviews and we're going to be previewing every game well, not every game but we're going to be looking very deep into teams now and, and, and analyzing which players need to stand up but start with the boys bendigo and tazzy bendigo will bounce back i mean they're nine in a row losses on uh, eight whatever it is i mean uh, I have to go Tassie. They've got no form yep. to prove it. Dandy and Calder, I'll be at this one. Yeah, the battle of the two risers of the talent league through the middle of the year, I'm going to back Dandy Nong at home. Yeah, this is a really tough one. I think it won't be close, weirdly. I just think one team will be better than the other in a, in a quite a decent way. I'm going to go Calder in a, a bit of an upset on Dandy's turf. 
Keen right. to see Felix Knife and Kufa Duff Tytler back in for Calder and for Dandy Nong, Tyron Amu and Charlie Rowe return from Halebury. Sandy play Geelong and they'll have a lot of schoolboys back, yeah. both of those teams. I think that'll be a bit ugly to be honest. I, I think Sandy are going to flex their muscles a little bit and uh, Geelong are in great form, but we saw with the prelim last year, talent just at some point has to override things and I reckon Sandy will do it by like five goals. Uh, I think it'll be less than two goals. I think Geelong have been really competitive through the middle part of the season. They get 10 schoolboys back. It's going to be quite a tight contest. So I'll still go Sandy, but not by heaps. Keep slain to Northern. Kippy. Yep, likewise. Murray have Western at Wangaratta. That's, that's like the Gold Coast, playing in the Gold Coast. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's what it that is. Way. Well, Dandy would suggest otherwise, but um, Murray. Yeah, I'd have to agree. And then Oakley have GWV at RSCA Park, the second part of the double I'm header. I'm so keen for this game. This might be my game of the round. I think Rebels prove a point here. And I think Oakley prove a point. They both want to prove a point because they've both been – we know both of them have lists that suggest they could get six to eight drafted. They haven't quite been able yeah. to put it together for various reasons, schoolboys and injuries, um, a combination of those two. But on the girls' side, uh, we should mention Oakley played Western yeah. um, on the weekend. Oakley getting the job done 11 13 79 to 2 13 Western's match against Tassie got cancelled. Oakley had one less game for the season. For the girls' talent league, Chloe Bowne really stood up in that one for Oakley. But, um, yeah, the rest of this round uh, resumes this week. Week call to have Northern at Highgate. Northern. Likewise, Oakley have Sandy at Warrawee Park. I don't want to think about what's going to happen in this one. If four weeks ago was anything to go by, but Oakley. Yep. Likewise, Gippsland have Murray at Highgate. Gippy. Likewise, Bendigo and Tassie play each other at Latrobe. Tassie. Yeah, yeah, Tassie will get up in that one. Western have GWV at Avalon Airport Oval. That's a tough one. I think Western just... And I'm going to back GWV and then Geelong have Dandenong in a battle of two really strong country outfits. Yeah, this is an important one uh, in the context of the ladder and I reckon Dandenong will beat them again. Yep, I'd have to agree. All right, that wraps it up. Thank you all for watching. Like we said, next week, back to Talent League. It is a, a pretty much pretty sure it's a strict Talent League uh, episode mm. next week and that will be for the remainder of the year. A lot of exciting content coming, so make sure to check out our socials for all that. Thank you all for watching and we'll see you in the next episode.